Our gospel meeting in Fort Worth with the Handley congregation this past week went very, very well. One responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, for which we're thankful. The brethren there said they were encouraged, and I know this, they encouraged me and they encouraged Julie with us being with them. You know, we had a, a surprise on Monday night. We got there and Brother David Haley was there. And then Tuesday night, Larry and Jennifer Williamson were there. And so I thought the elders probably got with them and said, go check on him, make sure he's where he's supposed to be and where and he, he's behaving himself. So I hope I got a good report. But it was a great time. The, the congregation there in Handley used to be a thriving congregation numerically. They've whittled down somewhat because of location and other factors. But they have a great nucleus. They're looking to relocate to, again, continue working in the Lord's vineyard. They have four very good men serving as elders there. One of them is Brother Dan Flournoy. And we all know Dan. He's been with us before. And so keep them in your prayers, in your thoughts. Also, I want to thank those who filled in for me when I was gone. Forrest taught class last Sunday. Of course, Tyler preached Sunday morning, Sean Sunday night, and Brother Gary Chambers taught class on Wednesday. And so that makes it so wonderful to be gone in knowing that I've left putting you in great hands with those individuals who teach and preach so wonderfully well. Let's not forget this. Next Sunday is the fifth Sunday here. And so Brother Michael Wyndham is going to be with us. Now Brother Michael is one of the students at the Brown Trail School of Preaching, but he's not one of the younger students. He is retired. He worked secularly as a lawyer, as a judge. And so Michael is a very sharp student of God's Word. And I'm looking forward to hearing him and I think you will be too, so be praying on Michael's behalf. Now, this morning as we get into our study, we want to say welcome to everyone. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you're here. We're, we're thankful that you have chosen to come and study God's Word with us and worship and praise our God. We want to encourage you to come back this evening at 5 o'clock. In fact, what we're looking at this morning will be focusing upon still tonight. And so think about this with me. We've got one focus in these studies, and that one focus is Christ. You remember Hebrews 12 and verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Well, that's what we should be doing daily. Certainly when we come here together, we need to be fixing our eyes on Jesus. Remember what Paul told his brethren in Corinth? I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. Notice those four words, Christ and Him crucified. That's our focus. It should be. In Colossians 1 and verse 28, we proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that every man might be complete in Christ. You see, we're not complete outside of Christ. That's why people need to hear about Jesus. We need to teach and admonish everyone. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Christ's sake. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. And so we have one focus, and that is Christ. Notice this, we have one target, if you will, and that's your heart. You know, in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is the target. That's what we're aiming for. We want you, like those on the day of Pentecost, to be pricked in their heart. You know, a lot of times, not uncommon to hear after a gospel sermon, maybe one that is stronger than other ones, for someone to say, you stepped on my toes. I've told you before about the preacher. He was told that. Preacher, you really stepped on my toes this morning. 
And his response was great. It was a classic. He said, well, brother, I apologize. He said, I wasn't aiming for your toes. He says, I was aiming for your heart. Now, that's what gospel preaching always does. It aims at the heart. In 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, God doesn't look at things the way man looks at things, does he? Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. In Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29, God says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they might fear me and might keep all my commandments always. And so God's focus is upon the heart. His word, it's so designed that it can penetrate our heart. In Jeremiah 4 and verse 14, they are told, well, Jeremiah 4 and verse 4 first, They're told to circumcise yourself before the Lord. Cut away the foreskin of your heart. God says, I'm focusing upon your heart. That's what I want from you, your heart. Later in that same chapter, chapter 4 and verse 14, wash your heart from filthiness. You remember when you go to Joel, the second chapter, we are to rend our hearts and not our garments. To return to God, he says, with all of your heart, Joel 2, verses 12 and 13. And so Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, Matthew 5 and verse 8. And remember, Jesus also says that first and foremost commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, Matthew 22 and verse 37. So we have one focus, and that's Christ Jesus. We have one target, and that's your heart, my heart. And likewise, we have one purpose with all of this, and that is to love more. That you might grow in your love more to Jesus, that I might grow in my love more. Again, that's what it's all about. We love because He first loved us. 1 John 4 and verse 19. The love of Christ controls us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. And so our one focus today and every day, it's Christ. The one target in preaching His Word, it's your heart, my heart. The one purpose that all of us might love Him more. That we might grow in that love. Now think with me about this. Three people in mind, we're talking about as we preach, as we teach, as we come together. We have three people in mind, but notice notice this. First, those not yet Christians. Maybe you're with us this morning and you've not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we're saying this morning is, our studies today can help you. Maybe you're here with that unending question and we all have these questions, why? Why should I become a Christian? Why should I serve the Lord? Why should I love Him? Why should I be obedient to Him? That question of why, why, why? Well, studying the Bible, specifically what we're looking at this morning, it can help you with that question. It can answer that question, why? Remember what we just said in 1 John 4 and verse 19? We love Because He first loved us. When we see what He has done for us, when we view how deeply He loves us, that helps us answer that question, why? But not only those not yet Christians, but notice this, those who are Christians but not steadfast. We're taught to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. But you know what? There are those within the congregation here, and they're not steadfast. They're not immovable. They're not always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, many of them want to be, and we want to help you to do just that. But once again, what we're saying is what we're studying this morning can help you can help you become steadfast, can help you become immovable, can help you always to abound in the Lord's work. It can help you, instead of lagging behind in diligence, 
to become fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Read Romans 12 and verse 11. Stop being lukewarm. Start living your life based upon resolve instead of excuses. And typically, here's what we do when we're not faithful, when we're not steadfast. We make a lot of excuses for why. Get rid of your excuses. And again, put on some resolve. In Luke 9 and verse 51, with resolute of heart, Jesus fixed his eyes to go to Jerusalem. He had resolve for us to accomplish for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Can't we have that same resolve unto him? Can't we reciprocate that love, that commitment? Yes, we can. So again, we've got three people in mind. And again, those not yet Christians, and Christians but not steadfast. And also, notice this third one, faithful Christians. This lesson can help you also. If you're doing right now, if you're striving more than ever to be pleasing to the Lord. You know, Paul said, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9. If that really speaks about you, then this lesson can still help you. It can help you excel still more. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 1 and also verse 10. It can help you grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. So this lesson, in essence, three people in mind? Yeah, all of us. Every one of us. We're going to fit into one of these categories. And our study from the gospel can help. What we're saying this morning, this is a tall order. You know, in essence, what can do all of this? Well, as we've already said, one thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It can convert a soul. It can help those who are lagging behind in diligence to become fervent. And it can help every faithful child of God to per press on, pursue even more. You remember in Psalm 19 and verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. In Romans 1 and verse 16, the gospel of Jesus Christ is God's power unto salvation. It was when Paul wrote to his brethren in Rome, it still is today. It's God's power unto salvation. And that engrafted word, it's able to save our souls. James writes by inspiration in James 1 and verse 21. So a tall order, yes. But God's word can accomplish it. What are we looking at specifically? We're going to look at the suffering of Christ. We're going to start focusing today and probably continue in two weeks on this right here, the suffering of Christ. I need to be reminded what Jesus did for me on a daily basis. Always carrying around in our body the dying of the Lord, that his life might also be manifest in our body. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 10. That's why we think about the dying of our Lord. That's why we think about the suffering of our Lord. Why? That his life might be manifested in our body. I'm going to put some verses up here. We'll mention some of these. We will read a few of these. But I hope you have your Bibles. If you don't have your Bibles, there should be one in the pew in front of you. If you don't want to turn there, then you listen very carefully. Very carefully as we read some of these verses. The first three here from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is what Jesus has to say concerning his suffering. Okay? So turn with me first to Matthew 16. Let's read what Jesus tells the disciples here. Matthew 16, verse 21. Now keep this in mind. In Matthew's account, here's the first time Jesus begins to inform his apostles about what's going to take place. He begins to teach them. He will say the same thing basically in chapter 17 and also again in chapter 20. But look what he says here, just this one verse. Matthew 16 and verse 21, it says, From that time, 
Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Think about that. He's teaching his disciples that he must suffer many things. You remember Peter's response tries to tell him, no, Lord, not for you. Jesus said, yes, Peter, this is exactly what I'm telling you. Get behind me. You're not setting your approval on things that are heavenly. But look at this next one. In Mark 8, you know, we read in, in Matthew 16 that Jesus must go to Jerusalem. Notice how Mark phrases this. In Mark 8 and verse 31, look what it says here. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. You see, none of this took Jesus by surprise. Jesus knew why he came to this realm. He came to suffer. He came to die. He's teaching his disciples now. But in Matthew's account, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Here, must suffer many things. Jesus knew that's what he was heading towards Jerusalem for. What he must do, he must suffer. Look, if you will, at Luke. In Luke 24, in verse 46, interesting how this is phrased. In Luke 24 and verse 46, Jesus is speaking here. And then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Jesus said, This is something I must do. This is something that is necessary. Why was it necessary? It had been written. It had been written. These next three verses... They're going to tell us about that. This is what the law said. This is what Moses indicated. This is what the prophets prophesied. That Jesus, when he came, when the Messiah came, that he would indeed suffer. Turn with me to those three verses. In Acts 3, look what it says here. Peter is teaching here in Acts 3. We just want to read verse 18. Look what it says. But those things which God foretold. Now emphasize that. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And so this was written. This was foretold. This is why Jesus said, I must suffer many things. It was necessary for the Christ to suffer. If he's going to fulfill that law, he had to do these things. Look, if you will, the next one. In Acts 26, read with me just verse 23. I might, I might pick it up in verse 22. Look at this. Acts 26. In verse 22, this is Paul before Agrippa. But look what he says here. He says, therefore, in verse 22 of Acts 26... Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. Stop here. Did you see that? Paul says, I'm here defending myself because of help from God. But he says, I want you to know this. I'm here because I've said nothing more. Nothing more than what the prophets have already prophesied. And what did the prophets prophesy? Look at verse 23, that the Christ would suffer. That he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Turn back, if you will, to chapter 17. Paul is in Thessalonica here. And look what he says specifically in verse 3. Paul, at the end of verse 2, he is reasoning with the Jews from the Scriptures. Well, look at verse 3, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So look at that language. Jesus said, 
I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to suffer. I must suffer. It's necessary for the Christ to suffer. Why? It's written. The prophets foretold this. And so in Acts 8 in verse 4, remember when they went out everywhere preaching the word? This is what they were preaching. They were preaching the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Paul delivered to them what was first delivered to him. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried. And was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The scriptures prophesied these things. That is the gospel. It's the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord. It involves his sufferings. It involves the very thing that we're saying this morning. Has the power to melt our hearts. To prick our hearts. Oh no, we're not stepping on anybody's toes. We're aiming at the heart. This can convert your soul. This can save you from your sins. Again, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, we've mentioned this verse. But Paul says, the love of Christ controls me, having concluded this, one died for all. Paul says that message right there. That's what compels me. That's what constrains me. That's what controls me. One died for all. In Hebrews 5 and verse 8, although he were a son, yet he learned obedience through the things that he what? Suffered. The sufferings of Christ. He learned obedience through those sufferings. Turn with me to this next verse. It says something great about Jesus. In Hebrews 2 and verse 10, read this with me. Hebrews 2 and verse 10. Notice it says, For it was fitting for him, for whom all things are, by whom all things. It says, In bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. To make the captain of their salvation perfect. How was that accomplished? Through suffering. He learned obedience to the things that he suffered. He was made perfect through suffering. And again, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 11, it talks about the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. That's what I want you to think about throughout this whole series. The sufferings of Christ, yes, and the glories that would follow. Not only Him being glorified, but the glorious things that are true for us now because of his suffering. Now, let's do this. The best passage in the Bible, I'm talking about suffering. We're going to contend 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 25. Now, I know it's hard to pick out the best passage, the most complete, concise context regarding the sufferings of Christ. We could have gone to Isaiah 53. It rivals this. We could have gone to all four of the accounts of the life of Christ when we see Jesus on the cross. Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, John 19. We see the sufferings of Christ culminate upon the cross. But for our purposes, for our study, we're going to go to 1 Peter, the second chapter. And we're going to be looking at verses 21 through 25. Let me say this. I know we're running out of time. Within the next two, three weeks, when you have a spare moment, I'm not talking about interrupting your Bible study, your Bible reading, but if you've got a spare moment and you have about two or three minutes, pick up your Bible, read 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 25. An amazing context. Let's read it together right now, and then we'll start making some points. We'll only have one point this morning, but look at this. In 1 Peter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 21. We'll go through verse 25. Listen carefully. It says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, 
And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You know, we're just going to be walking through this context in studies to come. Come back tonight. We're going to go deeper into this. But this morning, here's the first and only thought we're going to mention. Notice what it says again in 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered. Notice that Christ suffered. I know we're stating the obvious, but I also know we're proclaiming the glorious. We're reminding us of the wonderful, the incredible. Christ suffered. We mentioned already, although he were a son, yet he learned obedience to the things that he suffered. Christ suffered. Someone has said he was born to die. And while he lived, he suffered. Isn't that a great statement concerning the Christ? He was born to die, but while he lived, he suffered. It's true, Christ suffered. You go to any context, remember what we've already said? The old law, Moses, the Psalms, the prophets, they all testify concerning this. That Messiah, when he would come, he was going to suffer. Remember Isaiah 53 and verse 3? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He suffered. My soul has become troubled, he says. In John 12 and verse 27, he suffered. You know, the story was told of the preacher. And the preacher was preaching on the sufferings of Jesus. And it really touched one little boy. He's listening with that childhood innocence, unable to comprehend and grasp this suffering and, and really to, to be able to, you know, just see anything suffering. It, it hurt this little boy, but he's talking about Jesus, the preacher was, and he's suffering. And so the little boy, as the preacher kept speaking, he began to sob. And as the preacher kept preaching, he began to cry. And the more the preacher preached, the more he cried and the louder it became. And his mother was a little bit uncomfortable. She's trying to quiet the little boy. And finally, in desperation, she leaned over and she told her son, don't take it so seriously. I wonder if that's our problem. I wonder if the problem is we don't take it as seriously. We've heard all this before. The sufferings of Jesus, yeah, you can preach on it. We can hear it. We've heard it before, though. Brethren, we need to take this seriously. This, as we've said, is what's going to convert a soul. This is what's going to change. That one lagging behind in diligence, it's going to motivate them to become fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And it's going to help the faithful remain faithful to continue to increase and excel still more. Yeah, let's take it seriously. You remember Jeremiah 12 and verse 11? No man laid it to heart. That was the problem in Jeremiah's day. He's preaching, he's teaching, but they didn't take it seriously. They didn't lay it to heart. In Luke, the 10th chapter, beginning in verse 25, the priest and the Levite, they saw the man who is suffering. What'd they do? They walked by on the other side. Let's make sure that we're not today like the priest and the Levite. In hearing about Jesus and his suffering, just walk by on the other side. Not take it too seriously. You remember in Lamentations 1 and verse 12 what Jeremiah asked the people? They're walking through Jerusalem. Jerusalem's been destroyed. It's in rubble. And Jeremiah says, is it nothing to all you who pass this way? Well, we preach and teach concerning the sufferings of Christ. 
Isn't that a great question to ask? Is it nothing to us? Is it nothing to all you who pass this way? You remember in Matthew 27 and verse 36, what it says about the soldiers at the feet of Jesus on the cross? It simply says, and sitting down, they watched him there. They did just that. That was their duty. That was their work, to crucify him. Sitting down, they watched him there, but they missed the most glorious thing that would ever be done for them and for all humanity. Jesus upon the cross. Let's make sure that we don't come in and sitting down, we watch him there. And then we, like the priest and the Levite, go by on the other side. Don't take it so seriously. Oh, my friend, take it seriously. Christ suffered. He suffered for me. He suffered for you. There is a drawing power that is attached to the cross. You remember in John 6, verses 44 and 45, Jesus said you can't come to the Father unless he draws you. Well, then he explains what that drawing is. They shall all hear, they shall all be taught. That's what it is. This gospel, that's the drawing power. That's how God draws people, is through the gospel. In John 12, in verse 32, If I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Jesus is talking about his death, the cross, his sufferings. It has a drawing power. Again, the greatest enemy that the church knew in the first century, Saul of Tarsus, he's the one that as Paul the apostle, having been converted, he's the very one that says, the love of Christ controls me. Having concluded this, one died for all, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Yet has drawing power. And the Bible teaches us in James 4 and verse 8, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. What a marvelous promise. What about it this morning? Did you come, on, come in here and you're not a child of God? You've never obeyed the gospel? Why not? Everything Jesus did was for you. Maybe you're here and you're not faithful. Why not? Why not? What are you going to do about it? If you're not a Christian, what are you going to do about that? If you're not faithful, what are you going to do about it? Will you do something about it this morning? In understanding what the gospel is, the good news, will you unite it with faith? Will you repent of your sins? Will you confess Christ as Lord? Will you be immersed into Christ to wash away those sins? That's what the Bible teaches we must do. And having done that, let's be faithful to that calling we have from God through the gospel. Let's be faithful. Let's grow and mature. Let's cherish times like this. Let's be enthused and excited when we can hear once again what my Lord did for me, what our Lord did for us. If you need this morning to make things right, we're going to sing a song, an invitation song, convenient time for you to come. If you have something that's amiss in your life, let's get it right. We can help you. We want to help you. If you need to study more, a lot of people here would love to do just that. But if you need to come, won't you do so right now? while we stand and as we sing.